cannot help but uh, be a bit emotional. Yesterday I turned 75. I can see myself laying up in that hospital bed I was 29 years old and they told me I need to stop preaching my lungs were shot We serve a mighty God. Yes. So, Deb, you surprised me with the CPC stuff. <laughs> Given my love and regards, she was my administrative assistant for 20 years. You, you, you surprised me. You, you, you got me. Got me. I'm very, very grateful, folk. I, pastors don't deserve things like that, but we're, we're encouraged when love is shown. And if you had not done it, if you had not done it, this congregation has already shown that they love their pastor. And I appreciate it. And I appreciate it. We have some serious stuff. For the next four, maybe five weeks, I was wrestling with God last night, and we may have to do six sermons rather than four, because, hear me now, hear me now, this issue of oneness, and I, and I, and I, keep, I keep coming back to that prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17, Balcony, John 17. And he prayed that the church would be one. Not that they would be better Sabbath keepers. Not that they would follow the health message to the T. He did not even pray, Sanjay, that they would be faithful in tithe returning. Interestingly enough, he didn't even pray about the morality. He didn't pray that there would be less divorce or less adultery or less mortification. There was a host, there was a plethora of things that Jesus could have prayed for for his church. And, and the prayer takes on meaning because it's his last prayer before he's crucified. It is the prayer, according to John, that Jesus prayed at the Last Supper. And what wound up being the focus of the prayer? Not these things I mentioned. He simply prayed, Lord, help those people to learn to be one. He saw that as a bigger problem than doctrine, He said there's going to be a growing problem in his mind and I need to beseech the Father for it. What is it, Jesus? They're going to have an awful difficult time learning to get along in the church. And it disturbs me, I'll say, that, 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 that Christ would focus on that, but the fact that he did says to me, he saw, listen to me, he saw that as the prime problem of the church. Now, the heart of the church is the family. The heart of the family is the marriage. And the heart of the marriage is two people, man and woman. It's the only alternative that the Bible offers, man and woman. 
There is no divergency. Could I say it again? Man and woman. It's not a discussion in the Bible about anything else. Man and woman. So, here we are. Because the month of February is traditionally Black History Month, I will, in one of my sermons, particularly focus on damage done to the home and family of oppressed people. I'll get into that in the third sermon. But today I'm, I'm laying the groundwork, and, and, and my text is John 16, 13. Put that text back on the screen, brethren and sisters. Would you read this with me? And then we'll pray. Come on. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Read it carefully now. Keep, continue. In the original language, this text is in the reflexive. This means that the passage is referring back to the person who is speaking, scratch, back to the object of the person who was speaking. God is speaking through a spirit about the work of the spirit. He's going to guide you into all truth, but it's reflexive. So what it's really saying, Rosalind, is that God, listen to me, God, the spirit will guide you into all truth about yourself. So I'm going to talk about today the problem in the marriage. And the problem in the marriage is the two people in it. The problem in the relationship, if it's not a marriage, boyfriend, girlfriend, fiance, buddy, buddy, friend, friend, coworker, co the problem in any the problem in any relationship is the two people in it. Are you following me? And the Bible is saying the work of the Spirit, Kita, is to drive you, draw you, teach you about yourself. So much so that what he hears, that is, what he knows about you, next phrase, he will tell you. Let's pray. Father, please help me. Amen. Now, it's extremely important as we deal with this passage to understand it's the base passage for the four sermons. You can't be in a relationship and be successful in that relationship unless you're willing to be honest with yourself. Can anybody say amen? Next week I'm going to quote from a book written by a Dr. Smith who Oprah Winfrey made very famous uh, she wrote the book, Lies Told at the Altar. Most people who form relationships that are going to lead to marriage don't get as honest as they need to be before they say, I do. So lies come into the marriage. And the sermon next week, we're going to deal with that very specifically. We're going to talk about things that happen in building a relationship that keep it from being honest. You know, marriage is the only relationship in the Bible that is consistently compared to God's relationship with us. Isn't that true? And the reason why it is is because the same phrase 
is used to describe both. When talking about, when talking about the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the Bible says these three are one. When talking about the husband and wife, the Bible says, and the twain shall be one. So God, this is amazing to me, requires the same kind of openness and oneness in human relationships that he, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all have. This is why I tell people, when you're courting, you got to court, you got to court at least minimally. Don't call me up about no premarital counseling when you have not been courting at least a year. Don't call me. You're not ready? No, 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 no. No. How can you how can you discuss marrying somebody you don't know? And the function of marriage is not the revelation of you. The function of courtship is the revelation of you. So don't make that call. You know, it takes at least a year for a person to get naked. I knew he was going to be shocked by that phrase. <laughs> you, 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 should, you should have seen your faces. You know what I mean. I'm not talking about taking your clothes off. I'm talking about finally being around the person long enough to see them in every situation the way they really are. You got to catch them upset. You got to catch them when they forgot to brush their teeth. You have to see how they react around their parents, around their family. Watch them around people. Watch them around you. How do they disagree? And do not think that a person who is consistently disagreeable is going to suddenly become agreeable because somebody says, I do. Am I telling the truth? But what you're going to see in these sermons is the reason why that person may be disagreeable is because of some unsettled issue in them. In fact, Dr. Smith says that most issues in marriage are the result of unresolved issues from childhood. Somebody started knocking them upside the head when they were a child, and so they want to knock somebody in, uh, upside the head after they get married. Why are y'all so quiet? Let's look at the Bible. Where are we going? I said, where are we going? Number one, marriage requires two singles who are trying to reflect God's image. Genesis 1.26. See it? Read it. Then God said, Oh, start again. You're just mulling up the whole text. Come on, let's go. Come on. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, here's what God did. Here's what God did. Look at verse 27. Now, I didn't give you verse 27, brother. See if you can bring it up. Look at verse 27. Find it. See if you can put it up there. Verse 27. 27 comes after 26. Okay, here we go. Ready? Read. So God, watch this now. So God.
created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. Okay, so both male and female are equal expressions of God. Equal. What word did I say? Equal expressions of God. Man is not more of an expression of God than woman. Equal expressions. The, the, the Lord took his himness and divided into a themness. You see, God, mankind could not be in the image of God unless he was more than one because God is three. And the human family are three. Father, mother, children. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen. amen. So, so, watch it, watch it. Since the Lord put his image in the man, in the woman, then the first thing that any single person wants to have, you want to be a true reflector of the image of God. And if the person you're spending time with if the person you are a friend with, if the person you're planning to marry, if your best buddy does not reflect the image of God, then they're not holding up their end of the relationship. Are you with me so far? This thing is serious. You can't be in the marriage what you didn't bring from your singleness. In fact, you got to know Christ good before you marry. Because marriage is going to test every Christ in you. How are we doing so far? Is this thing plain to you? It's got to be plain. So, so if you're sitting here today and you're single or you're a teenager, you think about one day, you need to be, you see, we, we spend too much time working on the person working on the relationship. Work on yourself and your relationship with God. Bring into the relationship a solid, rich, deep, unbreakable relationship with God because marriage by its nature tests your connection with God. So that's your first contribution. Does this person pray? Do they read the Bible? In fact, when, when couples come to me for premarital counseling, the first question I ask them is, does this relationship you're in, has it brought you closer to God? And if they drop their eyes, mm, start waggling their feet, looking down, Look me in the eye and tell me that your relationship with this man, your relationship with this woman has brought you closer to God. Tell me. Look me in the eye. Say it. I'm a better Christian because I met them. If you can't say that, why are you in the relationship? That is if you want a Christian relationship. Now, now maybe you don't want a Christian relationship. And you should sign out of this sermon right now. Tiptoe on out. But if you want a Christian relationship, it's got to be grounded with somebody. And you see, you, ah, ah, don't, te don't tell me that you're going to help them get better. I, 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 know, I know they're not saved yet. I know, no, not a Christian. I know they don't really believe, but, 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 but we love each other. Ah, 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 oh, oh, God is love. So if they don't have God in them, how can they love? I know these amens are hard to come up with, but just humor me. Just, just try it. So, see, we're talking about oneness. Oneness. So if both people bring the image of God. Yes. Both pray. Both read God's word. Both love to worship. Both are full of kindness. They say, well, pastor, you're talking about some perfect person. No, no, I'm not. But at least let them have some evidence that they're trying to go in that direction. Don't let them get to know you fully before they seem to be trying to know God fully. What happened to us in the Adventist church 
that somewhere along the way we've taken God out of the marriage. And these criteria we have, well, what kind of person are you looking for? Well, I want to have a job. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't want to look a certain kind of way. Well, here's the thing about looks. They don't last. Have you noticed that? Don't look around. Don't look around. They don't last. They do not last. You can cream up, tie up, bind up, pull up. It don't last. So, therefore, hey, hey, you need to have something that's going to last through eternity. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a contact with God, full of Jesus Christ. Because if the person is full of Christ, then when things begin to sag and bag and go away because they're connected to God, they see you as God sees you. Someone to love. So the first thing we need is two people who want to reflect God's image. Is that all right? Number two. Read, mar everybody, marriage needs two people who know how to partner. The word I should have used is share. Let's get the text. Let's get the text. Put the text up. Come on. Then God bless them. And God said to them, be, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over everything, living thing that moves on the earth. In other words, the first thing he gave to Adam and Eve was to work together. Yes. Work together. Now you need to watch that. See, as a single person, are you, are you, and, and see, and see, here's the thing about, it. see, b b being, being single can teach you some bad things as well as good. But when you're single, you get wrapped up into self. My money, my house, my car, my job. And you, you get used to, you spend when you want to spend. You don't have to ask anybody anything. Yeah, you're single. You don't ask, well, is this too much to pay for the dress? You buy yourself. Pay what you want to pay. Am I telling the truth? Yes. Then you decide to get married. And he wants to know, how in the world did you pay $250 for that? Well, brother, don't say that. <laughs> the dress. At least say the dress. Don't say that. I mean, you're already on dangerous ground, so at least say the dress. My point is, listen to the pastor, my, listen to me, my point is that, 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 that in order, if you, in other words, if you're thinking about getting married, then you have to ask yourself, am I a single who's ready to share? Share budget, share money, share house, share bed, share bathroom, that share bathroom, was a, that, that's a challenge, share bathroom, come on y'all, share closet. Some of y'all know I'm telling the truth. And don't think because, the, because that, that, that you're in love that suddenly you're going to change. You've been used to doing things your way. So really, if you're planning on getting married and you're single, you need to start practicing sharing. Share with somebody. The dog, somebody. Share with somebody. Just practice sharing. Is pastor making any sense? The second quality is two people who partner. He said, be fruitful, you know, manage the earth. Do it together. How well do you work together? Because, because there are many marriages that are struggling because one person is still trying to dominate. They never learn to share. All the couples, just keep your eyes straight. Don't be kind of looking. <laughs> Not trying to create any problems here. Am I making sense? Yes. See, this is about oneness. Here's a person single. Here's a person single. Got job, got job. Got house, got house. Got car, got car. Got stuff, got stuff. Got career, got career. You're going to bring it together. That does not happen overnight. You need to pray. Ask the Lord to help you come to a sharing spirit. 
But more than that, we see that coming to the church. That's why some people in the church, you can't work with them because they don't know how to work with anybody and unless they have full charge, full say. Now I'll get into the temperaments in the second sermon and show you why some of you are afflicted with bossiness and take chargeness. You're a pain. <laughs> and a problem. But we will see that even though your temperament may be bossy or controlling or too fun loving or too quiet. I just I just went through the I just went through the four temperaments right there. That God can help you. See, folk, we're talking about oneness. Let me tell you why the Lord invented the church. See, the family's not enough to get you to be the way you ought to be. See, the church is full of all kinds of people. If you can get along with all the folk in the church, you're going to heaven. You know you're going to heaven. Because the church, we're, we're a group. Now you know we're a group. All kinds of people in the church. All kind of attitudes and and temperaments and 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 and, and false holiness in the church. So if you can curb, come to love everybody in the church, you you your 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 mansion is guaranteed. So God said, what they don't get to practice at home, I'll let them practice the church. Let the church say Amen. So here we go. Here we go. So you got to be able to work together. What do you got to be able to do? Work together. First thing, you got to reflect Christ. What do you got to do? Reflect Christ, work together. Now, I'm already saying the sermon's going to be too long, but I planned that. I plan. I'm fine. I'm fine. You, you, I'm fine. I, I, will stop. See, I, I will stop in the middle of a sermon in a minute and tell you to come back next week. Tell him, come back next week because I ain't going to finish this. Okay? Number three. Let's put number three up. Ah, read it. Marriage needs, requires... Someone who knows. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, we're not ready for that yet. Go back to number two. Genesis 2.18. I've got to get that in. Genesis 2.18. Got to get that in. Now this one blows the mind. I cannot preach this sermon without doing Genesis 2.18. Here it is. And the Lord said, it is not good for man to what? I will do what? The Hebrew says, I will complete him. Adam was unfinished without Eve. Remember he said that male and female? Remember that? Remember read that text? Both are equal expressions. So until there was a female, God was not fully expressed in the human family. So now Adam, I'm going to complete you. And, and, and he did it very subtly. Remember he had all the animals pass before Adam? Remember that? Named them. And Adam was a quick study. By the time the day was over and all the squirrels are going, the squirrels are going by and the rabbits and the donkeys and the giraffes and so forth, Adam, he, he got it. He said to himself, there's two of everything. There's one of me. God said, go to sleep, you're not finished. <laughs> and finished him, took a rib, rib built him, built him, built Eve, built her, built, built, gave her to Adam. Now, 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 now. In order, we're talking about relationships, not just marriage. See, singles, you need to listen to me. You have a chance to practice. In order for you to be able to be a good friend or spouse to anybody, you must be willing, watch it now, to cooperate and to adjust so that a person can complete you, you can complete them. That is, you have to be able, here's the word we don't like, to compromise. See, folk, two sinners together, that's a problem. Isn't that a problem? So you have to be able to compromise, to be able to know, I just can't let this thing always go my way. Great character building to be able to just shut up sometime. Say, okay, all right, well, go ahead. How good, how, see, don't, let's don't talk about marriage. 
how good are you with that just in being with your buddies and friends? Everybody wants to do something, and you want to do so and so and so. Are you able to just back up and do what everybody else wants to do? I'm talking about doing something right now. I mean, are you able to do that and not have an attitude and not feel defeated? Do you know how to complete others? To lift and complete others? Are you with me? Now we go to number three. Number three. Number three says marriage needs someone who knows marriage's priorities. Go to Genesis 2.24. Now watch this. Therefore a man, read it, and be, and they shall be, okay, all right. Therefore shall a man leave. The first thing that marriage requires, or any relationship requires, is that you change your priorities. Marriage cannot withstand any rival. Not work, not friends, not other people of the opposite sex, not hobbies. If you're going to be married, you've got to be able to put another person first above yourself. going to be married, you have to be able to put somebody else first above yourself. <laughs> if you're going to be married, you have to be able to put somebody else first above yourself. Amen. Now, folks, let me tell you something. Amen. You're wise not to say amen strong. Because that takes a whole lot of person. See, why do the beans have to be fixed your way? Why do you always have to take a vacation where they, where you want to go? And when you decide to marry, you're saying, this person except for God himself, is the most important person in your life. And you have to demonstrate that in all of your decision-making, and a spouse should never have a question in their mind but that they are number one. So if you're courting someone, you need to begin to check, are, 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 they, able, are they able to really, with joy, put you first? Can they do that? And this is why, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are rearing small children, children need to learn early on they're not the only person on the planet. Amen. And when you're spending, listen to the pastor, spending your time appeasing your child to make them happy, you are preparing a monster of a husband or a daughter or, or a wife. They're going to be a monster because they, you're, teaching them, you're teaching them to believe that they must always be catered to. Then shall a man leave. That is, he puts everything aside, the woman leaves, and they make their spouse number one. Number what? Now take that and apply that to the church. Supposing in the church we start having the attitude, come on somebody, that the person sitting next to us is more important than me. I'm, I'm going to try it over here. Okay. <laughs> Supposing in the church we reach the point where we decide that anybody sitting on the pew with us is more important than me. Ooh, brother. Folk, that's what Christ did for you. How dare we hesitate to own that? He left heaven and glory, put us first, and we have this attitude in our hearts 
that somehow somebody must be beneath us in order for us to be somebody that insults the sacrifice of the cross. It's intolerable to God. He will not save you with that spirit. This is serious. If you only feel good when people are lifting you and don't feel good lifting people. I spent my birthday yesterday calling folk in the church who were down. No, 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 no. I'm not bragging. I'm simply saying, I try to do things to fight that self-centered spirit we also have. You know, 75, so now, now everybody's got to cater to me. No, 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 no. I called this person and that person and that person and lifted others because brothers and sisters, until you can with joy put other folk before yourself, you'll never see the kingdom of God. He will not let you in there and bring that spirit. Leave father and mother. Put another person first. And then it says cleave. The Hebrew word there is a word that describes concrete. Concrete is a combination of cement, sand, and water. If you're going to have a solid relationship, you have to cleave. The sand, I don't care whether you're the sand, the cement, I don't care whether the other person is the cement, but I know this, for the two to mix, you've got to have the water. And the Bible tells me the water is the Holy Ghost. You've got to have God in your life for that relationship to work. Because if you don't, self rises up unexpectedly. You know some of you who are married, you know you've been, some of you have been married for years, you know that that spouse can just say one little word with a certain tone and you are agitated for the rest of the day. Somebody say amen out there. They can prick your buttons in a minute. There are people like that in the church. Don't sit there pious. There are people in the church, you know it, when they speak to you, you get irritated. Because they have a little tone in their voice. They're nosy and they're picky. That's why it's important. Uh, it's important. It's important, Deacon Smith, stay in the church. Because the church is going to prepare you for heaven. As a deacon, you work with all kinds of people. And there are people who are grateful for you being a deacon. And there are people who treat you like nothing because you're a deacon. Want to be able to smile. Smile in every situation. I recently got a letter from a member of the church. It caused me to smile. They ripped me up one side and the other. Yeah, they did. Yeah. And I was just as, I read it and I just smiled. I smiled. First of all, some of the things they said were true. See, why are y'all sitting there looking like that? See, when people can say things to you, about you, that are true, that you don't want to hear, but they're telling you the truth, and you can take it, you're ready for the kingdom of God. Yeah. Took that letter, laid it down, shared it with some folk, laid it down, and that night I went home, Slept like a baby. Why? Because if someone sees, listen, bad in me, why should I be surprised? Last time I looked, him you right as a sinner, saved by grace. So if somebody sees something bad in you, they're just seeing what's there. That's right, Brother Merchant. There are no angels who attend TPC. And then the Bible says, in that same verse, cleave, 
and they shall be one. Should be what? One. It's not the word for unity. It's the word. It's not the word for unanimity. It's the word for unity. The most important thing you can learn in a relationship is this. It's not important to agree. It's important to always understand. Uh, spouses, did you get that? You have to agree with her, understand why she disagrees with you. If you want to agree with a person all the time, I recommend singleness. But, but, if you want to be an expert in understanding, then marriage is for you. Are you with me so far? Let's go to number six. Marriage requires what? We'll stop here. The Bible says, let's read the text. Read the text. Ah, look at that. Read it. Start again, everybody. Do you see it? They were both what? They were both what? And they were what? Oh, I love this text. It's not talking about clothes, by the way. Read the Bible. Here's the thing about marriage. You can't hide when you're married. If you stay married, Linda, if you stay married, Trevor, then you want to know everything there is to know, Dunbar, about Debbie. She can't hide. You can't hide. See, when, that's, why the, that's why marriage is like a relationship with God. You can't hide from God. And the thing about marriage that makes it so character building, here is a person who if you live with long enough, they know it makes you afraid, they know it makes you angry, they know it gets under your skin. You are totally exposed to them. And the greatest gift in the world is to find somebody who loves you that way and will never use your weaknesses against you. Somebody give God glory. That is awesome. Now, hey, supposing the church was like that. Supposing in the church we could come here tired, angry, messed up, jacked up, tore up. But not worrying. Because we know when we get to Coma Park Church, they're going to hug us. Come on now. They're going to greet us. They're going to smile at us. They're not going to talk about us. And if you're a single person and you've not reached the point in your life, where you have the courage just to be who you are, for real, no pretense, naked, exposed. If you want to live a life of pretense, acting like you're something that you're not, then stay single. Because marriage requires somebody who's willing to just, I mean, to be exposed, to be exposed. I remember the first time I was able to meet, admit to my wife, well, she was my girlfriend then, that I was afraid to preach, nervous when I preach. I've been invited to do a week of prayer at this big church. I was a student at the seminary. We were courting. And um, I was talking about it. I said, I just, I don't, I don't think, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm just, I get so scared, my, my hands sweat, and I'm just talking to her and so forth. And 
She was so precious. She just listening. And it's, good, you know, it's good to be around somebody who knows when to keep their mouth shut. She just listened. She didn't say anything. Just listening. Got done. She said, Henry, she said, um, you can do that. She says, it's not about your fear. It's about your call. See, I wanted her to say, I wanted her to say, you don't have to do it. I understand you're afraid. It's about your call. But in the conversation, I began to realize I wasn't less in her eyes because she found out that I'm afraid to preach. Are you listening to me? And, and, and my love for her just extended. I, I can be safe with her. Even though I had this growing reputation, even as a young man, that I could preach and be up front, I was able to say to her, it really isn't me. The real me would like to sit in the back pew and keep my mouth shut. But she said to me, Dr. Deshay, you can do it because it's not about you, it's about your call. She was saying in a nice way, see, she didn't want to bust me, so she said in a nice way. She was really saying in a nice way, ain't about you, it's about God. Come on, somebody. If you can become the kind of person who knows how to accept a person's weaknesses and not use those weaknesses against them, to hurt them, to use them. This is why the Lord is totally against sex before marriage. I expected it to be quiet. Because sex is an ultimate vulnerability and should not be shared with someone who's not embraced all that you are, not just your body. I don't feel bad if you went there. We're growing Christians. So anyone who's been there, don't, don't, don't start ducking in the seat. I'm simply saying to you that the Lord wants our vulnerability to be exposed to those, I'm going back to number one, who have put God first. Amen. And the person who has put God first is not going to ask anything of you that would separate you from God. Is that okay? We're done. You're done. Next week, part two. What makes you tick? I'm going to break you down next week. I'm going to get inside your head. I'm going to help you understand why you act the way you act. Why you can't get along with certain people. And why certain people have a difficult time getting along with you. I'm going to talk about the four temperaments. How many? Four. The bossy cholerics, the controlling melancholics, the hide behind the smile sanguines and the hide behind being quiet phlegmatics. We're going to talk about why this church has difficulty getting along. Now, my brothers and sisters, Some of us need to do some praying. This sermon stepped on somebody's toes. Let's bow our heads.
Am I reflecting your image? Do I know how to partner? Do I know how to complete others? Do I know how to make others priority? Do I know how to be in a cleaved relationship, a concrete relationship, committed? Do I know how to understand even when I don't agree? And finally, do I know how to be naked? Is any of that me? And if it isn't, then I need to go to God. Now, Lord, while I've presented, we, we've laughed a bit, we've smiled a bit, but this is serious. I've got this determination in my head that the congregation that I pastor, along with this fine staff of pastors, that we actually can be a church that's different. That's a place where people really feel that they belong. We're going to get there. We got a lot of walls to pull down, a lot of pretense to get rid of. We're going to get there. We want to be the kind of church that when somebody walks in and says, I miss you, we know they meet it. I'm praying for you, we know they're doing it. I'm going to help you, we know they're going to follow through. We're going to get there by the grace of God. So help us, Jesus, to do exactly that by your grace. And if there be someone online watching this who needs to be in contact with me, encourage them, Lord, to be so. Because next week, it's going to be even more, more, and more revealing as to what work the Holy Spirit has to do in us that we might be the fulfillment of the prayer of Jesus, that they all may be one, even as we, Father, are one. Bless us to that end. Now, before I close this prayer, if there's a need in your life erected by this sermon that needs attention, would you have the courage to raise your hand? My eyes are closed, so I won't know whether you raised your hand or not. If there's a need in your life that was touched by your sermon, raise your hand. Now, Lord, for those who raise their hands, send the special blessing that they need. In Jesus' name, amen. We're not going to sing the song. We're going to go straight to the appeal for tithe and offering.